Before we move on to Nintendo Power's 10th year, it's time to look back at where the game industry was in its 9th year. For the first 8 years of Nintendo Power's life, as far as console gaming was concerned, Nintendo firmly had a firm lock on shaping what console gaming would be like. The games that people played in Nintendo consoles were the, ga were the games that people were ultimately looking for on all the other consoles, if not the exact same games in terms of ports, like Street Fighter, than the types of games, fighting games, platformers, shooters, RPGs, and strategy and simulator games. What competing consoles, like the TurboGrafx-16 or PC Engine in, in Japan, or Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, had to do to differentiate themselves was to find ways to do those games better in one regard or another, or differently. The Genesis didn't have Nintendo's Draconian's content guidelines, so Mortal Kombat, for example, on the Genesis could get away with all the blood that defined the arcade version, creating a version of the game closer to what people expected from when they played it in the arcades. With the introduction of early optical disc add-ons, also came the option for those consoles to include proper spoken cutscenes and more involved music, including primitive full-motion video. Meanwhile, the Super Nintendo stuck with cartridges with Planned CD add-ons falling through, often due to issues and decisions made on Nintendo's end, but with Nintendo always retaining their control of the market. On the PC gaming side of things, we would get some platforming games, particularly as we entered the mid-90s, both on uh, DOS, MS-DOS PCs and on the Amiga. The focus on those consoles, in terms or uh, computer platforms rather, tended to be on simulators, strategy games, and RPGs games which thrived on the added input options that a keyboard provided, or on adventure games which similarly could take advantage of a keyboard for a text parser or the ability to use a mouse. With the convenience that a mouse provides, um, and accuracy and precision, I should add, that a mouse provides, but that a controller's D-pad doesn't quite match. All of this was aggravated, or made more complicated, literally, by the fact that configurating add-in cards on computers for sound and graphics were something of a hassle in ways far beyond that they are now, with the need to configure COM ports in some cases on a game-by-game -game basis, and some games just not working at all on certain video cards or sound cards. Setting up a new game for your computer required a hobbyist level of enthusiasm, like configuring your computer for each game in the ways that a racer would tune a car for a particular track. And now we come to 1996 through 1997, the years covered by Nintendo Power's ninth year, and a range that really changed everything in many ways. Part of what I'll be using for reference for this is the various issues of Next Gen Magazine that I've been recapping on my blog over at CountZeroOR.com, so please feel free to check out those recaps if you want to see me go into the what's going on in the industry in this date range a little more in depth. This is meant to be an overview, divvied up by platform. Let me start, start off with personal computers, the Mac and PC, for particular. Prior to year 9, Microsoft had already put out Windows 95, moving the graphical user interface more into the fore of the operating system, uh, as sense of DOS basically being sort of still being present, but not with Windows being a graphical shell overlaid under a DOS core. Well, what we got in 96 and 97 was Microsoft announcing and starting to roll out to the DirectX platform. DirectX was meant to serve as sort of a collection of programming libraries for Windows meant to make video card um, manufacturer and game developers' lives easier. Specifically, they are meant to simplify communication between the video card drivers and the operating system simplifying the process of doing stuff like configuring, configuring COM ports when setting up the card, but also making it easier for software renderers and game engines in the games to communicate the information they need to with the video card so that everything displays properly. The ultimate goal is to create a situation where you, while you could optimize a game so that it would work better on, say, one video card chipset or another, you would, you would not have a situation where that game wouldn't work at all on any video card outside of a particular model, be it because of the manufacturer or because of how the chipset has changed between versions. Now, DirectX at this point has not accomplished it all out of the gate, but DirectX 1 started the ball rolling in that 
uh, direction, and later iterations would expand on this further to the point where we're at now, where basically you can put a uh, ATI or NVIDIA video card in your computer, and it will play pretty much any game. Again, some games will work better than others. You will have uh, NVIDIA, for example, pushing out game-specific optimization, driver settings optimizations for their games based on the video card drivers and card versions, but ultimately, your game will work on either um, card, generally. Now, the limitations of the direct 3D renderer, which is out at this point, combined with the rise of the open source movement, will also lead to competing uh, open source rendering libraries like OpenGL, which ultimately is uh, for the best in terms of progressing the how this works and making it easier for, again, video cards to pick what video card you have to be less of an obstacle to whether this game will run at all outside of stuff of how graphics intensive the game is, not because the game developer has to manually optimize the card for a uh, the game for a bajillion different cards. Apple would begin development of their own competing initiative alongside the creation of the planned Apple Pippin game console, but Apple's eventual move away from gaming, likely related to Steve Jobs' return to the company, ultimately killed that project. Related to all of this is that this is the period where we have the launch of Quake, the unveiling of Unreal, and the rise of the build engine with Duke Nukem 3D. Three different first-person shooters that moved away from the sort of faux 3D of Doom into more fully 3D environments, including increased interactive, interactive ability, as is the case with Duke Nukem 3D. I mentioned Engine there. These games, combined with the development of DirectX software libraries, also led to the rise of game engines as a business in terms of middleware for 3D gaming. With the increased needs of software development in a fully 3D polygonal environment on PCs and eventually consoles, the ability to license an existing in game engine to offload some of that work to make things easier for developing these games helps tremendously. It lets you focus less on the nitty gritty of how lighting works in your game in terms of being able to do lighting at all and more on the design and that sort of thing for making a good game. It also helps with the issue of controls and that sort of thing as stuff like that is built into the engine side of things. This will become a very big deal on PC and down the road will also carry over to consoles. This period also leads to not only first-person shooters retaining their popularity, but also the rise of the real-time strategy game. Blizzard will innovate on Westwood's Dune 2 by creating Warcraft and later Warcraft 2, but also Westwood will do their own innovations with Command & Conquer and Command & Conquer Red Alert. Speaking of Command & Conquer, one of the things that that game featured was acted full-motion video cutscenes. And the reason we have that is because around this time, more and more home computers were being shipped with CD-ROM drives, along with people installing optical drives on existing computers or incorporating them in computers they're building themselves. CD-ROM versions of these games also provide the opportunity to incorporate better music, but also full motion video as a way to tell the game's story. Where this would really shine on PCs would be in the adventure game genre, starting with Myst and the Seventh Guest, um, getting a significant mainstream success with Myst being a tremendously top-selling game for decades to come, but also being further innovated on by Sierra Online, for example, with games like Gabriel Knight 2 and Phantasmagoria. And then there's the matter of the two new consoles on the market, one from Nintendo's longtime rival, Sega, and one from newcomer, relative newcomer, Sony. We will cover the Saturn first, in particular because it launched a little earlier, not as early as the 3DO or the Atari Jaguar, but earlier than the PlayStation. Saturn blasted the mar onto the market with an announcement during E3 that the console was available that very day and with a somewhat flawed port of Virtua Fighter as the launch title. While the quality of some of the later in Saturn releases improved, the console had a few significant hurdles to overcome for success. First, due to some decisions with the architecture, the console was somewhat difficult to develop for, particularly when it came to 3D games. The console used two separate processors, which were theoretically supposed to work together to handle um, graphics, one for polygonal objects and one for background elements. 
but the way they worked on the architectural side made writing for it tricky. To make a comparison, while the introduction of multi-core processors um, by AMD and Intel created some stumbling blocks for software developers to really take advantage of the expanded hardware initially, the barriers there were related to addressing multiple processors on the same die, which were otherwise identical in terms of the structure and how they worked. The two video display processors in the Saturn are different for like two different processors, which presumably would handle um, work with slightly different instruction sets, which makes things more complicated. Again, since one handles sprites and polygons and one handles backgrounds. On the one hand, this meant as a developer, if you really wanted to dive in and get into the weeds, you could do some interesting stuff with this, but this could be a service of the barrier for other developers and particularly causing a problems when it comes to porting software between different platforms, be it between two consoles at the same time, like the Saturn, and the PlayStation, or going from the PC to the Saturn or even arcade to Saturn. That said, the Saturn still has some very strong titles during this uh, first year of life. The subsequent Virtua Fighter sequels are incredibly strong, as are the racing games for the system developed by uh, internally by Sega. And ultimately, the Saturn, not the PlayStation or N64, ended up becoming Capcom's first console of choice when it came to their sprite-based 2D fighting games because the game, the console handles 2D so incredibly well. Um, we have Darkstalkers coming out on the Saturn first, same for X-Men versus Street Fighter. Last, but definitely, lot, definitely not least, is the Sony PlayStation. Now, I mentioned that Sony was a relative newcomer to the market, but that's not 100% accurate. As you may recall from earlier episodes of the show, the PlayStation was Sony's name for their CD-ROM drive add-on for the Super Nintendo that they developed as part of a verbal agreement with Nintendo. An agreement that Nintendo had backed out of in favor of an agreement with Philips, the very CES where Sony was set to unveil the prototype system, and Sony found out about it when Nintendo announced their agreement with Philips. In other words, the PlayStation isn't just Sony deciding to venture into the market to try their hands at making a console. This is Sony making a statement that revenge is a dish that actually takes a long time to simmer, but when it's done, it's delicious. The PlayStation has two distinct advantages over the Saturn and N64. Like the Saturn, it uses optical media, so it's less expensive to publish games for than the N64 and its expensive cartridges. And in the event of a chip shortage, the only thing being impacted is console production, not software publication. So you can still put out the games for whoever has already got your console by now. Your existing install base is, will not be impacted. However, unlike the Saturn, well, one, it's cheaper. Uh, Sony took advantage of the early announcement of the Saturn by following up with a lower price point Um though a later release date. But also, the PlayStation designed to be easier to develop for. Now, we could all get in, like really in the nitty-gritty as to which console is graphically superior to the other because of the software development environment, but ultimately what this means here is that the ease of software development helps PlayStation get a bigger software library earlier. Does this mean that some of those titles were garbage? Absolutely but there are also some very insignificant gems here, particularly in this first year. For starters, at this point in the PlayStation's life, Capcom has already put out Resident Evil for the console, tremendously innovating on the work of the survival horror game beyond the groundwork laid by the original Alone in the Dark and Capcom's earlier Sweet Home. Further, the console had already started to show that this was the place to go for JRPGs, with Camelot's Beyond the Beyond, Konami's Suikoden and the first Persona from Atlas coming out during this period with Wild Arms being on the horizon and Final Fantasy VII already being out in Japan. Speaking of Final Fantasy VII, Sony and e Sony had gotten Square and Enix, which are still separate companies at this point, to decide that not only were they not going to develop games for Nintendo's um, N64, but that they were going uh, due to the decision to stick with cartridges over optical media, they were also going to make 
There are next Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest games exclusive to the PlayStation, giving them a significant edge over not just Nintendo, but uh, Sega as well. Because this means that, I mean, remember, Dragon Quest is a game series that Enix deliberately chose to release on weekends outside of the normal game um, console schedule, a uh, game release schedule in order to avoid getting flack from parents groups over kids skipping school to buy the game. So consequently, while Hiroshi Yamaguchi of Nintendo would make public statements in response to the hit that their stock prices took, stock price took of this announcement by demeaning all three companies, uh, Sony, Square, and Enix, the JRPG genre in, gen in particular, and the entire Japanese game market in general, this is a significant blow, and honestly, I suspect Yamaguchi's statements probably didn't endear Nintendo to the Japanese market. So where are we at in the market now as we enter the 10th year of Nintendo Power? Well, for the first time since we've started this series, Nintendo is the underdog in a way that they've never been before. Sega has gotten a slight lead at various points in the past, such as before the release of the Super Nintendo, but after the release of the Genesis, and particularly once they'd gotten the Genesis in Walmart with that extra market share exposure that they got from there. But they, no one, honestly, had ever gotten to the point where I described them as having eaten Nintendo's lunch. Um, Nintendo is still certainly irrelevant, is relevant in the, the conversation at this point. Um, but like going from the estimated console sales that we're seeing in next gen, um, like Sony's PlayStation has not just a larger install base than the N64, but almost twice the install base. The N64 is beating out the Saturn, but both of those consoles, that is the PlayStation and the Saturn, have a bigger software library than the N64 does. And because those games are on optical discs, games that sell well, like Tekken and Street Fighter, can be reprinted or uh, give me printed at a, a lower cost than the N64 games. Your, your, you could do a greatest hit, so to speak, version of Saturn Street Fighter Alpha while the Street Fighter Alpha version of on uh, the uh, Super Nintendo has going to have a much small, smaller print run because it's so late in that console's life and has a reduced set of features. And there's no Street Fighter Alpha version at all on the N64 because the N64 doesn't handle that variety of 2D sprite well at all. So that, that kind of puts us where we're at. Ultimately, the N64 is going to maintain enough of a lead and the uh, Super Nintendo or is going to fall. It's it's getting into life. And the Saturn is going to... The Saturn is going to scrape by for a while, but this is very early showing to be a clear cut win for the PlayStation and demonstrating that honestly, Nintendo is in, is on the back foot is on the hind is behind and it'll take a lot of work for them to get back in full control and try and get to where they once were in the future. No, as far as for um, Nintendo Power's 10th year, there's some good games coming up. We have GoldenEye 007, Star Fox 64, and Yoshi's Story to look forward to. But first, next time we'll be taking a look at Clay Fighter 63 and a third. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.